Hello, I'm Carlos Garcia with Open Door to District 8 and City Hall. We're here with our first guest, Ginger, uh, who's the head of our public uh, works department. And we've been hearing a lot of rumblings at the city. Uh, be before we get to that, I want to know a little bit more about you. How long have you been with the city and, and when did you start loving trash? Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, Councilman Garcia, for having me on your show. I'm a Phoenix native, born and raised, actually grew up in South Phoenix. Um, so I've been with the city of Phoenix now for 21 years, and half of my career has been in the public works department, so I love to talk trash. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm, I'm one of those trash talkers as yes. well. Yes. So we're hearing a lot of rumors. We might not have any more recycling. Recycling might move to twice a month. What's actually happening? Why are we having this issue? Why are we having the conversation about recycling and the possibility of our rates going up? Yeah, so Councilman, as you know, uh, Public Works is responsible for providing solid waste services to our Phoenix residents. So we have about 400,000 customers that we serve with weekly residential um, collection of garbage and recycling. Um, so we charge $26.80 per month for that service. However, that rate has been the same for the last 10 years. And so we are at a point where we are in need of a rate increase. And so we want to take that out to the community and to get input. We've done our best to keep our costs down, um, but just over time, um, our costs have increased. Um, you know, population has grown, and there are also changes in our industry. So we're trying to respond to that. So we haven't done a rate increase in 10 years. Is that the norm? Is that something that happens in other places? And where are we at in comparison to other cities? So Councilman, 10 years is a very long time to go without a rate increase. Um, historically, what we would do is do rate increases every year or every other year. Um, when you compare us to other Valley cities, um, they are also increasing their rates. But Phoenix is probably the second highest in the, in the county. And so the reason for that is because we have 400,000 customers, whereas other cities may have 50,000 or 100,000 customers, as well as we are providing services to all of our customers throughout 518 square miles. Um, so that is a lot of territory, a lot of land to cover. Um, the reason that we've been able to go 10 years without a rate increase was because of the recycling market. When it was good, it would actually help um, subsidize that monthly fee. I also wanted to talk about some amazing things. I got to take a tour of the facilities yes. and I was really impressed by the compost. Mm -hmm. Right, And I was told that this is one of the most high tech, uh, I guess, facilities anywhere in the country and even anywhere in the world. We've had yes. people come visit and see what it's about. Can you tell us a little bit more? of what that's about? Yeah, so it was great having you out at our compost mm -hmm. facility and having you tour our recycling plant and our operations. So we have a state-of-the-art compost facility. It is, um, can actually process 55,000 tons of compost. So that's an industrial scale. And it's an award-winning um, compost facility as well. So it's the, one of the largest municipal ones in the nation. And the quality of the compost that we're producing and the time that we're able to process it in is uh, record setting. So mm -hmm. it's great um, that we're selling it on the market. Uh, and, and that's a developing market. But we also provide that through compost giveaways to our residents. And so it is in high demand. Yeah. That's awesome. One more thing I want to let people know is we have a lofty goal, and Ginger's in charge of it. By 2050, we want to have zero waste. Can you give us a little bit more of what that means and what that would mean for the future generations of the city? Yeah, so Phoenix City Council set a goal in 2013 for us to achieve a 40% diversion from the landfill by the year 2020. Um, so that's next year. And so that means re reducing what we consume. It means recycling. It means repurposing our waste. So what we call that is reduce, reuse, recycle. And so also City Council set another goal for us to achieve a zero waste goal by the year 2050. Um, so what we're trying to do is um, divert waste from the landfill, right? It's good for the environment. It's good for um, economic reasons as well when the market is good. And so it's just the right thing to do. And we've heard from a lot of youth, from a lot of millennials, that they're concerned about the future, right? And so we want to be our, do our part to be good stewards of the environment and making sure that um, we're not having to open up multiple landfills, right? Um, that we can keep the one that we have, keep it in use for as long as possible, and that would be best for the environment. Um, so I'm happy to say that as of July 30th of this year, that we did achieve a 36%, 36% 
um, diversion rate, and that is above the national average of 34%. So that's something that Phoenix residents should be very proud of. Oh, well, thank you so much for being on. There you go. We talked some trash. Uh, up next, we're coming up with Alfredo Gutierrez, former state senator in Arizona, and uh, Marisa Franco, the national director of Mi Gente. And we'll continue this conversation. And thank you so much. The future of Phoenix, hopefully the, the future of Mother Earth is going to be bright thanks to all the work that your department is doing. Uh, thank you, Councilman. Welcome back to Open Door with District 8, and I have two amazing guests today, two really good friends of mine, Alfredo Gutierrez, former senator, state of Arizona, Marisa Franco, uh, partner in crime sometimes, and also director of Mi Gente, National Political Home for Latinx People. So we're having a conversation here at the city. We just talked to Public Works about having to increase taxes. We're also having another conversation about possibly increasing fees for some corporations like Uber and Lyft, dropping people off at the airport. And Alfredo, I want to look to you for some advice, some institutional advice of this state. I know you were instrumental. Many people may not know that the reason the city grew, the state grew, uh, how it did is because there were some really effective uh, advocating and some really good uh, work that you all did um, in your time at the legislature. And I want to talk a little bit of infrastructure that was built back then, freeway systems, healthcare system, and all that. Well, I think one of the reasons we were so successful is that uh, our, uh, those who came before us had effectively abandoned their responsibility. Uh, they didn't build freeways. They didn't take care of the poor. They didn't create health care for, uh, for everyone in the state. They allowed Arizona State University to become a second-rate institution. They allowed the city of Phoenix to essentially ignore its citizens for so very long. And so there was a pent up demand. Uh, and uh, we were able to exploit that. We were able to, in effect, reach alliances and compromises to make those changes. All of those changes are based on one thing, having the, the, the funding to be able to make it. ASU is a, is a, is a research one institution, a great institution, because we had the money to invest in it. And that money we didn't print. It had to come from the obligation of a city and of a state to do it. And this city is, a, is, is at that point. It's at that point of whether or not it's going to decide the homeless. I mean, it, it, I have been to so many uh, seminars about what we're going to do about the homeless. And, and somebody just doesn't, they're homeless for a reason. They don't have a home. And so affordable housing is the way we resolve that. But you're not going to resolve that without a commitment from the taxpayers. And that means from commitment uh, from, from your, your fellow council people to raise the funding necessary. And I don't know why. Maybe one of your colleagues can tell me we have to sub subsidize Lyft and, uh, uh, and Uber at the airport. What do we have to do that for? Mm -hmm. We are the lowest rate in the country for a major airport. And what is the consequence of that, that travelers have to pay for the use of that airport because we're subsidizing uh, two multi-billion dollar corporations that are not particularly competent, you know. Um, and so I, I think you just have to, to begin to realize and begin to proselytize the fact that we're not going to get anywhere any further in this city without making a serious obligation uh, to raising the revenue and the resources. Now, having just said that, mm -hmm. I realize what happens. For your, your fellow council people, the moment you say that, are going to call you socialists or run like hell, because that's the one thing they don't want to do. And the rest of them are going to diddle and daddle and find 20 other ways of telling you that they're cowardly. But the fact of the matter is that you just got to keep pushing. If we're mm -hmm. going to resolve some of the social issues, that this city has, beginning with homelessness. The easiest one to solve, affordable housing solves it. And, and if you don't solve it, there's gonna be a hell of a lot more homeless people because people are being pushed out of their homes in the Garfield and South Phoenix, in, in Merivale, all over the city, people are being pushed out of their homes because it's become so easy to go buy somebody out with a bunch of promises. 
And then they're in, they're in the streets. Families are in the streets today because there is no way uh, to build affordable housing. There's one last thing, because I want my research to talk about. This city has so, many, so much open land. I mean, it's just sitting there. Sitting there in your district, in, in, in West Phoenix, there's thousands of acres of city land sitting there uh, uh, producing no income. And it could be just the place to begin to begin uh, building affordable housing. There'll be resistance. Because obviously there are some council people who would rather have homeless people than build homes. But that's a fight worth fighting for. Well, thank you. Melissa, a lot of people don't know your first organizing uh, was actually done with homeless folks. And mm -hmm. you did, you've done a spectrum of work. A lot of people see you as an immigrant rights advocate, but I respect you for everything you've done. Um, we had an interesting conversation about the basic income. It's a, it's a fad now. People want to talk about it. And, and you had a particular take about why it's a fad and also why the responsibility should be somewhere else. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, uh, universal basic income has gotten to be much more popular and, and well-known through the candidacy of Andrew Yang running for president and then has kind of re-branded re, uh, it as a freedom dividend. Um, and I think, you know, at first, I think there's a lot of good stuff about the, the policy, that there's a lot of good intention behind the policy. Um, but I'm originally from, from Arizona, I'm from Guadalupe, and I remember after NAFTA passed in the 90s and m virtually all of my uncles lost their jobs that were manufacturing jobs here. That happened to my own father. Um, you know, and these were people who, you know, maybe had a high school diploma and they were in their mid 40s and they were staring at a very long future with very little prospects. And um, it was at the time when we had at the federal level, um, federal welfare deform and the ending of welfare as we know it. And so to me, you know, when I hear this like, oh, this is a freedom dividend, um, just on a very personal level, right? It's like, you know, we need to come talk to people that, that have been broke, have been unemployed, have been poor, have been struggling to get make ends meet. Um, and, and those programs were completely done away with. Um, very specifically, the social safety net, the safety net that when something happens, and something happens to all of us at some point in our life, it can be whatever. It just becomes a question of like, as a society, as a community, what is our commitment to each other? And basic social safety nets that are public, that are funded by taxpayer money, that are not private, that are not charity, they are something that we all pay into, whether it's public education, whether it's healthcare, whether it's housing, whether it's mental health care. Those are all the things that help us that when any of us or any of our family hit a hard spot, that the, the fall to the bottom isn't the longest fall, that it doesn't have, you don't have to hit rock bottom. And so it is ironic, right? And, um, and I think it's just a conversation because there's people that carry those wounds. Um, that, that, that needed that assistance, that didn't get it, um, and had particular experiences trying to access the, that, that form of assistance. Um, you know, but I think that there's a good intention there, and it's a conversation starter, but it is not the final solution in terms of how we deal with rampant poverty, inequality, and the, the national, and I would say international decimation of all forms of social safety net, and how communities actually commit to holding each other when we hit hard spots. Thank you. Thank you both for that. And when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more of how we can go away from that or maybe how we can continue this conversation or, or start organizing or start this new generation of, of Phoenicians uh, to start thinking about each other, to start thinking about how we support each other and how we make uh, Phoenix uh, the, the best place in the country to live. So uh, we'll be right back and we'll continue this conversation. We're back with Alfredo Gutierrez and Marisa Franco. We had a great conversation in the earlier segment, and I want to bring it a little bit back to Phoenix or, or into our communities. Is it that we don't care about each other anymore, or what is it that makes us not want or, or trust government to be that social caretaker of our community? I think it's just, uh, th this, this, this is a city in transition. I mean, I can go back to, to the 70s. 
You know, when I was elected, there was only one bridge across uh, the Salt River. Uh, that's that's changed obviously because of the the the, the kind of the, the explosive growth. But the explosive growth has meant some some symptoms that haven't been taken care of. I talked about the, about the homeless, but you know, do do these uh, investors who go around buying houses in in the inner city have an obligation after they force somebody out of their home? to make sure there's income in this city. And if they do have an obligation, it's up to the council to make it happen. Part of this problem is how tough it is to organize around those issues. When we organized against the war, the draft was in place. And it was easy. Nobody wanted to go to war, except those of us who volunteered. When you talk about immigration, all of us who share those stories were there and ready to, ready, ready to fight. But when you talk about the homeless, it's, it's, it's just a much tougher issue to organize around. But we've got to do it. And the, the leadership, to a great degree, Carlos, has to come from the mayor and the council. And the reason it, it hasn't happened, frankly, is cowardice. The cowardice over the fact that it takes taxation. The cowardice over the fact that it takes resources. It's easy to give a tax break to a developer to build a building on Camelback. It's just really tough to take that amount of money and build affordable housing for the poor who, who, who clearly don't have a constituency. I mean, I didn't vote. Uh, and so it, cowardice is the reason this has happened. It's not because they're blind. Uh, and, and I use homelessness because it's the most obvious, obvious thing of all, but it's true of almost every social service uh, uh, that, that was once available in the city. Uh, to the, the citizens of the city that slowly and slowly been abandoned for that very reason. Uh, and so when you have an argument at the council of whether or not you should subsidize Uber and Lyft, it, it's embarrassing that you're having that argument rather than an argument about how you're going to build housing for the poor. How are you going to do services for the poor? How are you going to assure that every kid at Isaac School or the Roosevelt School District or Phoenix L has not only food but support at home to be able to succeed. How are you going to be able to do that? Frankly, that's what you ought to be arguing about and that's what we ought to be. You, the city council, the mayor, that's what you ought to be organizing about. The rich are going to take care of themselves. You don't have to worry about the Chamber of Commerce. They're going to take care of themselves. You, the developers are going to take care of themselves. They don't need the mayor's leadership or yours. The poor, they need your leadership. Yeah. Lisa, how do we have this conversation in today's world, in the IRL, URL, and, and, and now that you've traveled across the country and, and, and working with groups all over, how do we have this conversation? So like I said at the beginning, um, when it comes to money, when it comes to how we spend our money and how we bring in money um, at the governmental level, but even when you're thinking about how you run your home, um, how you spend your money reflects your values. And the question will constantly be for us, what's our, what's our shared commitment to one another? When it comes to like the issue around uh, Lyft and Uber, it isn't just a local issue, it's actually a national issue, and in many cases, again, international issue. And they have um, operated by the old adage in Spanish, más vale pedir perdón que pedir permiso. Uh, better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission, and we've seen that with tech companies across the country um, in, their, in their building up where they're not paying attention to what are the existing standards? What are the existing traditions? What about the existing taxi cab drivers and what they have to do? What are the rules of the road for them? Um, instead, it's, it's a disrupt, you know, fail, fail fast, disrupt, and, and, and remake. But what we're not thinking about is actual drivers. And I think that's a place to start. What is going on in the city of Phoenix, in the state of Arizona, that for many, especially young people and people of color, that is the, that's the main option that people have for employment. Um, and, and what does that mean? And what kind of conversation can we have? And I think meeting people there, where they're at and what their needs are, um, and really having the conversation like, is, it, is the city the problem? It is not a given that the cost of, of the rules of the road or the cost of pay to play gets 
transferred to the driver should it not be transferred to the company that's benefiting and profiting. Um, but centering a conversation on what are the lived realities of people and that they feel seen and they feel heard and they understand what the whole picture is. And also be able to see solidarity in their connection to existing drivers who are taxi cab drivers, who are immigrant workers here in the city, um, I think is a great place to start. Thank you both so much for being here, for coming into the open door we've set up here in District 8. We're going to come back with the final thoughts of, of this topic and, and where we're at with City Hall. So thank you much. And we'll, be, we'll be back soon. Welcome back. I want to talk a little bit about what the last six months have been like. I've been learning a lot, been learning a lot about issues I never thought I'd have to uh, think about or, or try to give input to. I have an amazing team. You may have met them during our inauguration. We have Jacqueline, Adriana. And this week I want to give a, a shout out to Simone Bolding. Simone Bolding for the last six months has helped us establish this office, has uh, brought her expertise and, and brought us together as a team. She's unfortunately going to be moving on, I'm sure to do amazing things, um, but she will leave her uh, piece and, and her pieces and, and her strategy with us here today uh, as we continue uh, uh, to build for District 8. We had an inter interesting conversation today as, as the city of Phoenix is coming up on some critical votes, one that's going to impact everyone in the city uh, when we talk about public works. and our utility bills, our water bill, trash bill, possibly going up. After the conversation we had today with Marisa, with Alfredo, uh, with Ginger, the head of Public Works, I really believe we need to start thinking about our future. And it might cost us all uh, a little extra monthly, but it's going to be worth it when we can look at our children, we can look at our children's children, and let them know that we did what we could to make Phoenix a healthier, better place for them. We had a broader conversation about what role do we have in subsidizing or impact, impacting corporations. We're having the conversation with Uber and Lyft. We have a vote coming up whether we're going to increase the fees. And I really want to make it clear that we will be voting to increase these fees. And it's not with the attempt or, or the willingness to hurt drivers or riders. But we truly believe that these tech companies have found a way to kind of go around the system, found a way to, to basically use our tax money to fund their corporations. And so I hope you understand, our office is always open to have these conversations. That's why we want to have this TV show. We want you to understand why we're making the decisions we're making, and we want to give you an insight into what's happening in the city of Phoenix, and in particular in District 8. I never thought I'd be an elected official, but here I am. I'm learning. I hope you could come to our office, uh, follow us on social media, uh, call our office, set up meetings. We'll be putting out uh, public office hours. Uh, we'll be heading out to Broadway Heritage Square pretty soon. Um, and we'll be, we'll be hopefully uh, seeing each other out in the streets of Phoenix. Like we said in the campaign and now in office, we will continue to work and put people first. Thanks for watching. Our door is always open. And remember, District 8 is here for you.